All right, people watching at home, we have changed the test to Tuesday. So hopefully, Johnny, you'll be back Tuesday. Morgan, Damon, you need to make um, appointments to come in and take the test. All right, so those of you that listened to the lecture know that we ended up in reconstruction on page two, and we are getting ready to talk about rebuilding the South. So reconstruction is is literally reconstructing the South. It has been um, devastated by warfare. It has been devastated on purpose by the Union and the uh, Federal Army. They burned things. They ripped up uh, railroad ties. They uh, displaced agricultural land. It's going to take about 10 years for the South to catch back up to where they were in 1860 agriculturally. So they are in a place of severe economic uh, crisis. We also now have 6 million people who are now free in a place where there is nothing for them. There, there is not jobs, there's not housing, there's not schooling. So one of the first things that Congress does is create um, in 1865, the Freedmen's Bureau. And this Freedmen's Bureau's intent purpose um, is to help unskilled, uneducated, uneducated, I can never say that word, poverty stricken ex slaves to survive. So these are, uh, again, six million people that have just been released from servitude, but have zero skills to either move forward, even if they did have skills, there's nothing available for uh, them at all. There's no housing, no work, no jobs, no education. And so the Freedmen's Bureau is headed up by General Oliver um, Howard, who will later be uh, the president of Howard University in Washington, D.C. If you're not familiar with Howard University, it is a historically black university uh, that has that is how significant uh, General Howard is uh, to the uh, uh, African-American community. Members included many Northerners, including former abolitionists who risked their lives to help freedmen in the South. One of our first vocab words that will definitely be on our vocab test on Monday is carpetbaggers. A carpetbagger is a negative connotation. And so what a carpetbagger is, and this is the only way that I hope that I can get you to get this mental image, is um, if you've ever seen Mary Poppins, when she sings um, uh, a spoonful of sugar and she sets her big bag up on that table and starts pulling stuff out of it, that's a carpet bag. We don't have suitcases. There's not a thing like a suitcase in this time. So a carpet bag is really a suitcase made out of fabric, made out of carpet. And so these northerner carpet baggers are people coming down with their suitcases to move in and take over the South. It is a negative word. It is still a word used in the South when they talk about northerners coming down trying to fix things. It is not a good word. But make sure that you know because we're going to get another negative word um, in a few pages. Carpet baggers or northerners, okay? Because we're going to have a bad word for southerners who work with those carpet baggers. They're called a different word. So that's the Freedmen's Bureau. The government understood that there is um, um, a purpose and a need to help support these ex-slaves. So the Freedmen's Bureau moves down south. They provide clothing, medicine, education, Please look to ex-slaves and poor whites. So there's going to be a reason why the former planter class will hate, bless you, will hate the Freedmen's Bureau. They're going to hate this with a red hot passion. They hate it because A, what it's helping slaves, that's really important, but B, poor whites. And the only way that the, that planter class had held on to that um, role and that uh, elite status was by keeping poor whites, poor whites, okay? Um, they are going to open schools. 
They're going to negotiate labor contracts. And number four, authorized to provide 40 acres and a mule from confiscated or abandoned land to black settlers. We know that did not happen. That was a promise. Um, there are, I believe it's still Spike Lee, who has a production company called 40 Acres and a Mule. If you've ever watched, and those of you that watch the credits all the way to the end, you will see Spike Lee has, he's, he's got that one, 40 Acres and a Mule, and he's got another one that I can't remember the name of. Um, again, that for the most part never did happen uh, as that promise. Uh, Southern violence against carpetbaggers and uh, freed blacks will be significant. This will be the beginning and the rise of the KKK. We're going to get that in a couple more pages. But this terror and this um, um, violence will be uh, tremendous and uh, will affect both white northerners and freed blacks. Anybody anyone that aids African Americans were targeted and at risk of violence, violence up into uh, death. In Louisiana in the summer and fall of 1868, white Democrats killed over a thousand people, a thousand people who were either black or white Republicans. And for the most part, no consequences, none. There were zero legal, legal repercussions for the killing of those people. The beer was going to expire in 1872. President Johnson's going to try to kill it. We're going to talk a lot about the Freedmen's Bureau. Uh, Johnson is, uh, again, always on the list of one of the bottom, top, bottom 10, five presidents in the history of our country. And the unfortunate pick and that could definitely be something that Lincoln did not think of, but I guess you don't ever think you're going to die and somebody take your place. It is an unfortunate pick for vice president that led him to office because he would have never, ever, ever in a million years been able to uh, uh, assume the office of presidency through an election. Um, and so again, bottom of page two, white supremacists. We have very few presidents that we actually refer to as white supremacists. It takes a lot to move from that. You're kind of racial, you're bigoted. I don't know how you can be kind of racial, but you're racial, you're bigoted, because we definitely have had those presidents uh, in our history. But we have two that we attach that severe definition of white supremacist, Johnson, and then in the 20th century, it's going to be President Wilson. Um, who is a white supremacist, um, and he will be our first white president uh, that we'll have when he's elected since the Civil War. Um, and I think I've already told you when they made him a stamp, I had a really hard time. Like, I do not want those stamps. Post office tried to sell me those stamps. This was back in the day when you had to mail everything. You couldn't pay bills online. And you had to mail it all the time. I'm like, do not give me those stamps. Why not? I don't want to tell you, just don't give me those stamps. I don't want them. So when we target, historically speaking, someone as a white supremacist, um, it is unequivocal. There is no discussion. There's no, well, he's awful, white supremacist. So at the top of page three, we get to reconstruction. And this, again, it will be where you find the answers. If you have not done that reconstruction plan, this is where your answers to that that chart is. Um, and presidential reconstruction, the Wade Davis bill, um, and um, eventually the other forms that are going to come into play. In presidential reconstruction, we had two because, right, we've got two presidents. Lincoln's was the 10% plan. His was very generous. His was that idea of with malice towards none and charity toward all. And the idea of let's just getting this nation back together and get back to the business of being the United States of America. Andrew Johnson, not so much. Andrew Johnson is a champion of poor whites against the planter uh, uh, class as a politician. He does own slaves. Um, and that is why Lincoln picked him. But what happens when he becomes president is a complete role reversal of that idea of champion for poor whites. Um, he, um, again, will be, um, uh, as number four says, the most overtly racist president in the history of the United States. Makes no bones about it, doesn't try to hide it, 
That's what he is. So the 10% plan says 10% of ex-Confederate states voters in 1860 had to pledge allegiance to the United States and obey the emancipation. 10% of your population had to do that. That would have been very easy to come up with. That would have been incredibly easy for 10% of ex-Confederate states voters to pledge allegiance to the United States. That's all they had to do was pledge allegiance and obey the Emancipation Proclamation. We can easily find 10% in every state that never owned slaves, so that would not have been difficult for them to do. The next step would be to uh, would be the creation of a state government, which Lincoln would then recognize. Congressional Republicans reject this plan. It is too lenient and it does not safeguard union goals. Um, and that is definitely would have been a huge showdown between Lincoln and Congress had Lincoln uh, not been assassinated. So Congress comes up with their own bill. It's called the Wade Davis bill. It is passed by Republicans. This requires 50%. And remember this 10% is only men, right? This would still be only white men. That would, that would make up that 10%. The way Davis bill says 50%. 50% of the state's voters in 1860 um, elections had to take oath of allegiance. And then they would have to have a constitutional conven convention that would require the ironclad oath. And I would make sure that you highlight that somewhere, that they never voluntarily aided the Confederacy. That is going to be really hard to find 50% of your population that never voluntarily aided the Confederacy. And the reason the Wade Davis bill takes this harsh tone is the state suicide theory. Republicans believe that Confederate states had forfeited all their rights by seceding from the Union. You did this to yourself. And so in order to get back, you're going to have to jump through these hoops. It is not uh, um, in our best interest to let you back in easily. As easily as you left, as easily as you caused trouble, you can do that again. Lincoln doesn't like this. This is all happening in 1863. Lincoln vetoes that. Republicans refuse to uh, seat delegates um, from Louisiana after it met the requirements in 1864. And listen again, 1864, we're not all the way done with the Civil War yet. So on the top of page four, we come up with this factional split in the Republican Party. And again, the Republican Party is a new party. Um, within each major political party in the 21st century, we have factions. So in the Republican Party, within the Republican Party, there's a small faction called the Tea Party Republicans. They're a different group. They're still Republicans, but they believe something just slightly different than the umbrella blanket of the, the Republican Party. Uh, they are There's the Freedom Caucus that's in the Republican Party. In the Democratic Party, there are um, um, uh, progressives that believe differently. So it's not unusual now to have factions within the big party, but in this new party, it was. And what we get are what usually is what happens is you have a, mon a moderate group, those people in the middle, and then you have 3B, a radical group. And these groups are going to, this group in particular is going to be called the radical Republicans. And they are going to dominate <clears throat> Congress for the next two years. These are our radical Republicans. These are the radical abolitionists that are going to take hold like Seward and Thaddeus Stevens. And they are radically going to change the United States. Thaddeus Stevens is from Pennsylvania. And it is really important to note that his common law wife was African-American. And she was common law because they couldn't marry. So he had a really big stake in the way that this country got put back together um, after the Civil War. These um, radical Republicans wanted the South's social structure uprooted, completely changed. The planters punished, and that's a key part, and blacks protected before states were restored. They want to punish those white plantation owners. 
Johnson recognized several of Lincoln's 10 percent go uh, governments while Congress was not in session. And so, again, bless you. That's what's going to trigger. And because of current events, everybody, I think, knows this now that Johnson was our first president to be impeached. It's usually something that nobody knows about. But uh, in light of our uh, previous year of um, um, impeachment processes, we now know that President Johnson is going to be our first president impeached. And one of the reasons that's going to be as a, uh, a vote of impeachment is recognizing these governments while Congress was not in session. So he believed, like Lincoln, that states had never legally been outside of the Union. And so in May 1865, he issued his own Reconstruction Proclamation um, and uh, pardon planters, um, and again, Republicans are going to be outraged, outraged. So here's the problem with Johnson. Johnson, again, a poor white Southerner who was supposed to be the champion of poor white Southerners is still overawed by that planner class and so badly wants to be a part of it. And the psychological makeup of him such that when these plantation class men come to his desk and his office asking to be restored, um, he grants them that in order to be considered now part of that group. And that, again, is where we get the problem with um, Andrew Johnson. White Southerners had a window of opportunity to get off easy in 1865 to 66 while Congress was out of uh, session, but their actions provoked Congress to react strongly. This is the huge shift and change that brings about radical reconstruction to the South. The bottom, oh, I did not know it's nine o'clock. Okay, white Southerners, um, here's what we're gonna, here's what we'll do. Um, Former Confederate leaders began electing to high offices. Alexander Stevens was the vice presidency of the was a vice president of the Confederacy, and now he's a senator from Georgia. So the senators object to the fact that they're going to be sitting in the halls of Congress with the vice president of the Confederate States of America. That was outlandish to them. Um, black codes, which we're going to see. Um, tomorrow or Monday, violence against blacks in the South began in the summer of 1865 with massacres. And these are real massacres, not Boston massacre five people. This is hundreds of people are going to die um, as a result of the KKK. The KKK is going to begin in Tennessee with Bedford Forest. And thus, please make sure that you note because this is always a question. Why did this radical Republicanism uh, uh, evolve and run the government? Because it was a reaction to white supremacy. And then we move from this reaction to white supremacy and punishing the South to responding to this violent, violent um, response to white supremacy.